Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Chasing the Dream, your podcast for all things human capital development. I'm Ethan, your host. I'm really, really excited to invite my friend on the program, Mark Roberts. Let me give you the quick intro, and then he and I are going to dive right into a discussion about him, his career, and our thoughts about the 21st century workplace. So, Mark Roberts, managing partner of my HR department, he is a recognized leader in the HR industry. And amazingly, he spent nearly all of his career working in nearly every conceivable aspect of HR. Not only is he an expert in connecting mostly small business owners and managers with customized outsourced trusted HR solutions that ensure that the people side of a client's business is strategically aligned with their organizational goals. Mark's also known for developing lasting relationships and his unique, I can attest to unique ability to work across industries, puts his clients at ease, knowing that he absolutely understands their HR needs. And he's proven through his track record of success that he understands how to help his clients achieve organizational success. So without further ado, I'm ready to go diving right in and chasing the dream. So welcome to the program, Mark. Hey, Ethan, thanks so much. It's a pleasure to be here. And with that kind of an introduction, when I get my first Emmy Award, you're going to be the first one I thank. Well, I, it's sincere. It's heartfelt. And, um, you know, I have an interesting perspective in terms of a career spent, first of all, 20 years in corporate where I was treated pretty poorly, which led me to this, which is why I always am fascinated and love people who spent their own, the, the earlier part of their career in HR and then went out on their own. So I just kind of want to dive right into the deep end of the pool and see if there's water in there and ask you kind of about your career in HR, but before you transitioned on your own and kind of your thoughts about the role of HR, what you've experienced, and maybe some thoughts about where you see HR going in the 21st century. Well, I'll tell you a very interesting story. So I started my career with an undergraduate degree in accounting, worked for uh, one of the top five CPA firms. After about three and a half years, I went to corporate finance, went through a number of companies, blue chip companies. My last uh, career in corporate America was with a um, a division of Continental Grain, where I ran the the global finance uh, operation for the business. And there was always something that was off. I mean, I was good at finance. I did all the things. And I, what happened was somewhere in, in, in my career, I interviewed for a for a position for a corporate controller for a well known um, retailer at the time, and this company put me through a battery of psychological tests, an interview with a psychologist. Long story short, I never got the job, but they were kind enough to send me a copy of the report that they got back, and I read the report and it said this guy is geared to social work, and I thought social work. I am, I'm a finance guy. This makes no sense. And I kept doing my finance thing. Lo and behold, uh, early, uh, I guess, yeah, I had been, I left corporate America after a downsizing in the early uh, mid eighties, went to work with my wife. We started a recruiting firm and it was very successful. We had uh, uh, 12 employees. We were doing, you know, almost seven figures at one point in time. Um, and then the the late eighties came, and well, actually, you know, the yeah, the downsize, the the uh, financial disaster of what one was it eighty, you know, late eighties, where I late nineties, I can't remember when, but when when we had the financial, it, it was right around the time that I I followed suit and got my undergraduate degree and kind of like yeah nineties. So early got out 90s. of that, went into went into staffing. Did that, took over, you know, became more of an executive search firm because many of the clients, we, we, we were doing what's called search research. Many of the clients asked us to take over full-blown executive search. We did that. The economy tanked when we had the financial crisis. And I went into, then we morphed from the from the, surf, um, from the staffing to the human resources thing because we regrouped. We were now in a lot of space with three people left because everything that we were doing went in-house Companies were no longer hiring. We lost our preferred vendor contracts. And we decided to go into the HR side of the business. And that was about 15 years ago. And what was interesting was suddenly I realized years ago when I was told, when I was the finance guy and told I was very well equipped for social work, I realized 
social work and HR, I mean, they match. How so? How so? Well, I mean, you're dealing with, you know, you're dealing with people and people's needs and, and, and whatnot. It's social work is closer, closer to HR than it is to finance work. In, in terms of the issues and things that you face. Okay. So it was, a, it was an epiphany that, wow, I was a, a square peg in a round hole for a lot of years. And when I, and I realized that was the piece that was missing. It just wasn't, con I wasn't connecting to the work. Mm -hmm. I, it wasn't, I wasn't enjoying it. Those Sunday nights would roll around and I would be miserable. Th that feeling. Yeah. And that feeling as Monday's about to roll around. Yeah. And so we got in, you know, we morphed out of um, the staffing because we decided that staffing was not happening, but there were still a lot of businesses that didn't have HR support. So we thought, okay, if we provide HR support at, to these companies, the staffing work will come about because we'll now be a trusted, a trusted advisor. We'll be doing... We'll be doing HR work. And as the recruiting comes along, well, I can tell you in 15 years, I think we've done maybe two or three recruiting projects and it's been strictly HR ever since. And I'm having fun now. I'm what, a, having, what a novel I, concept. Yeah. Su Sunday Sunday is not as painful as it used to be. Uh, I, I enjoy what I do. I enjoy working with companies, uh, solving their HR challenges. And uh, like I said, I was I was in the wrong place for a long time. But, you know, I'm fascinated with from the perspective of helping organizations solve their HR problems, right? You you must have seen quite a bit, especially over those last 15 years. Um, but I'm curious, can you talk through some maybe specific examples that you see as trends, things that your clients have kind of asked you for over and over again? And perhaps as it touches into the last few years, as we kind of transition through and out of a global pandemic. Well, there's a number of things that are going on. Um, you know, the pandemic just turned the world upside down, as we all know. You know, a lot of businesses just disappeared. A lot of businesses struggled to stay relevant. And a lot of businesses are still suffering from the pandemic. One of the big issues and the big debate right now is remote work. Mm. Do I make my employees come back to the office or do I continue having them work on, on a, you know, from wherever they choose to? And one of the things that the clients have failed to recognize when they when the pandemic hit and they sent everybody home in a, in a panic mode, OK, you go home and you work from home until further notice. Right. They effectively gave all of their employees a raise and in some cases a raise that is thousands of dollars in that there's no longer commutation costs. There's no longer picking up that Starbucks coffee on the way into the office. There's no longer the expense of dry cleaning your clothes so they look spiffy every time you show up. And those are real dollars that people have saved by not going to the office. Now companies are saying, well, we need you to come back to the office, but they don't want to address the raise that they gave employees to, you know, in asking them to come back. So now, you, now you're giving them a... a, a um, you're cutting their salary by having them come back now because you're not adjusting for the raise that you gave them. You're taking it back. I am. Um, I'm fascinated with this and I've kind of come across this in my own kind of area of consulting, but I'm curious about the notion of global pandemic, COVID hits, tell everybody don't come in, work from home. Right. And right. until further notice, except for essential personnel, et cetera, et cetera. Now, all of a sudden, as you said, an organization may be saying, okay, now it's safe, come back in. Do you find that organizations are failing to think through strategically how you allow people flexibility, who you want to come in and encourage to come in, who you want to give the opportunity to make their own decisions? Like, do you see organizations starting to kind of grapple with that? Or can, what's your experience? Because I see a whole bunch of people approaching this wrong. Yeah, they, I, I think they are approaching it wrong. There has always been the mentality of I can't see you, then you mustn't be working. Prior to the pandemic, I have a very clear vision of a client that we did work for that had a computer set up in one of their offices that monitored keystrokes of the people that were working there. Yeah. And, and I said to the, to the CEO, I said, why are you doing this? Well, I want to make sure they're working. Well, they're obviously working because the work is getting done. You'll know if they're working or not. If they're not getting any work done or your clients are complaining that things are not happening, it's a telltale sign that things are not getting done. Tracking keystrokes is ridiculous. 
So but, but doesn't that go even deeper? Isn't that really more a fundamental issue of, from your client's perspective? Look, we don't trust our people. And oh, by the way, backing it up, we've hired people that we're not sure if left to their own devices, they're going to be intrinsically motivated. Like, how does that play out in your conversations, if at all? Well, you have to, you have to, you know, trust is an integral part. You have to develop trust with your employees. You have to, you have to, what was it I read the other day? You have to, you have to give the employees the opportunity to fail, if you will. Mm. You know, if I hire you and you're the uh, director of sales and you have a budget that you have to achieve a certain number of, of sales during the year, you're either doing it or you're not doing it or you're struggling. Right. Right. But that's how I know you're doing it. And it doesn't matter if you're doing it, you know, on, on, on Tuesday, you know, if you get three sales or Friday, you get 10 sales. As long as you're meeting those numbers, you shouldn't really care how I get there as long as I get there. That that to me is amazing what you just said, because that that kind of validates the whole notion of giving your people autonomy over the work. Right. It's that whole Daniel Pink. Let your people decide when they work, how they work, where they work from and who they work with. It, that right. sounds like that's what you're saying. And something as simple as, you know, if you have somebody who's perhaps an accountant and has to get certain reporting done. Mm. Professionals know they have to get it done by X date and X time. If they miss the target, then you have a problem. Then there's something to discuss. But if they're getting it done, what what's the problem? And a lot of companies have, have gotten very uh, proactive in recognizing that they don't need the office space that they formerly had. There was, if you watched um, uh, the um, 20, what was that? Jeez, I can't even remember the show last night. Chat, see, uh, on TV last night, they did a piece on, um, on the fact that ni about 90,000 square feet of office space in Manhattan is empty right now. Realtors are, trying, are defaulting on loans and buildings because the real estate has, has diminished in value considerably, upwards of 40%. Some of them are just giving these properties back to the bank. Some proactive people are converting office buildings to residential. They're willing to invest in that. So this whole thing is vastly different. And the, it's, a, it's an ongoing wrestling match between employees and employers. Come back, don't come back. Employees don't want to come back because they've gotten used to working from home. Some employers are not accepting the fact that the employees will not come back. So in the midst of this battle, there's the hybrid approach. OK, come into the office two days a week or, or whatever the thing is, work from home, the rest. That's that's a fair and balance. On the flip side of that, there's a lot of issues where employees are not relating to each other because they're not seeing each other. They're they're sitting remotely in different people in their own homes or wherever they're working, and uh, so uh, there's a lot of issues to it. But I don't think I don't think remote work is going away. I think at best there'll be a hybrid uh, model. But again, companies are saving tens of thousands of dollars a month on the cost of real estate, and that floats right to the bottom line. I, I, I guess I mean this whole idea of remote versus hybrid or some flexible kind of alternate option that that's like that's critical. Like organizations, it sounds like you're dealing with this a lot. And I'm curious if there are other kind of big trends or kind of macro level things that you're seeing, just in terms well, of in terms of the workplace, in terms of HR. You know. Yeah, I mean, one of the the bigger the biggest issue right now is companies are having big trouble attracting new new employees and retaining existing employees. Um. Part of that issue is companies don't necessarily, I, I, I tell clients they have to funk, focus on one key, key trend, becoming an employer of choice. Yeah. You yeah. know, an employer of choice in, in, is, in the world. Yeah. And being an employer of choice is basically creating a, a brand as an employer, in addition to being a brand as a product or a service or whatever the case may be. You want to create an environment where I as an employee or anyone as an employee wants to come to work to you, be work for you because you have such a fantastic reputation. What does that translate to? You pay, you pay a, a fair market rate for jobs. You have a good corporate culture. You know, people are, are people are respected. The environment is good. A lot of I did a presentation uh, about you know getting close to a year ago for the building and realty uh, organization, large uh, large organization in Westchester County. They were having all all the various members that attended were having problems keeping employees. 
and they were looking for the the, the um for the for the secret sauce and i said there's no i started the presentation by saying there is no magic bullet here the magic in this is becoming an employer of choice making sure you're paying fair wages making sure you're giving people the right benefits the culture you know just creating a place that people want to work and one of the guys turned around at the end and said to me you know this is all very nice what you're telling us but i don't have time for that bingo so, bingo yeah. and bingo. and they were looking for the equivalent of a bumper sticker they could slap on the front door right. that identify them. Right. And I basically told them, this is a journey. This is not a, you know, just one day you're going to flip a switch and things are going to change. You have yep. to invest in the organization. And that's the disconnect why companies are having problems. Some people are very proactive in trying to do this and others, they just want somebody, they, they want a body to place into the job that's going to do the work and they don't want, they don't want to deal with anything else. And, so, and I get the fact that as employers, you have immediate needs that have to get done, but you've got to change what's going on. You can't get definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different outcome. Yeah. I, I've always been as, as you and I have kind of gotten better acquainted and kind of now know each other really well. I've always been drawn towards this philosophy you have, right. And this set of experiences over a career that kind of lends itself to what I say, you know, because I come at my clients a different way. I talk about culture transformation. I agree with you completely. I take it even a step further and I'd love your thoughts. There actually isn't a war on talent. I mean, there are some organizations who do exactly what you say and they've built these amazing reputational brands, whether it's Patagonia or Google or Virgin. People know what they stand for especially Gen Zs and younger millennials, they want to go work there because they share their values. And so top talent, nobody ever at these organizations struggles to get top talent. It's everybody else who's doing what you say. It's the bumper sticker approach where it seems like you're saying they struggle. Yeah, you have to. Um, you know, again, another area that we've done a lot of work is the diversity, equity, and inclusion. And, and now what's interesting is this has become a political hot potato because so, some politically, some places are saying, you know, well, it's unfair, it's unbalanced. So people are looking at it differently. So what's happening? So DEI in some cases now has been called IED. So instead of diversity, equity, inclusion, some of them are flipping it around and saying, well, we're doing more inclusion, equity, and diversity. Right. And it's just, and it still remains a critical factor, even becoming an employer of choice, because it's been identified as a topic that employees want their, their potential employer to be doing. And when we do that, some companies think, well, if I put a bumper sticker on the door that says, I support diversity, equity, and inclusion, they're done. Mm -hmm. The reality is, it is a, a, a come back to the concept, it is a journey. You have to talk to people. You have to have people involved. You've got to do focus groups internally. You've got to have management buy-in. You've got to have the board of directors buy-in. This is not something to do. And that's the same thing with this becoming an employer of choice. You can't just do it by flipping a switch and saying, okay, now we're going to be an employer of choice. How do you build a brand? Just a, a brand in, in reflecting the quality of your product. It takes time. You have to invest in marketing. You have to invest in quality control. It's the same thing becoming an employer of choice. You have to invest in your people. How many I, employers don't spend money on training? Right. They hire somebody. They get, you know, they get great employees and they just leave them in this job. They don't spend the money to train them, to make them even stronger employees, to train them to become managers, future leaders. Now, I get if an employee is not a great employee, you don't want to spend the money. But a small, and we're talking in some cases, a very minimal investment on training. I mean, sometimes training can be, you know, a, a learning management system that's provided by your payroll co company or somebody else where you can spend $25 per course to get somebody to learn some skills. Or you can spend thousands bringing in, you know, experienced consultants that can do, you know, in-person training or one-on-one -on -one training. But some companies, they just don't, they won't spend the money. But but here's my question for you, because you're kind of now we're getting to the heart of a lot of, I think is opportunity and challenge for organizations. And my curiosity for you is human resources, right? The first word in that job title would lead me to believe 
that in many organizations, human resources would be the tip of the spear to want to change that mindset from their employees as their largest expense to be managed versus employees as an organization's greatest competitive advantage. What's your thoughts on the role and the evolution of HR in terms of, because I have my own philosophies and beliefs about HR abrogating its responsibilities there, but what are your experiences about HR and kind of leading this, as you said, this change in mindset? Well, again, you know, some organizations, uh, we do, you know, our client base is small, small to smaller mid-sized companies. Um, the smaller companies, HR is a, um, it's a role that is usually some in a small client base, you're very, depending on the size of the company. In some cases, HR is a responsibility that is uh, owned by the office manager, uh, other people who are, have multiple titles and responsibilities in the organization. So their thing is, you know, hey, I got payroll done this week. I fulfilled all of my HR obligations. Right. Not the case. You've got, you know, an ever-changing employment law landscape. You've got issues with payroll. You've got employee relations. So a lot of companies just don't invest enough in HR. It's not important. Larger companies invest in HR, but again, depending on what their situation is, they don't. They may not invest in training. They may not invest in culture. They may not invest in resources. Look, you know what's really interesting is everybody will agree that employees are the most important asset you can have in your company because without the, the employees, you can have the best machinery, the best product but you're not going to sell it. It's not going to work, not going to happen. So without employees, it's very important. And people will invest in, in, they'll buy the best machinery. They'll spend a ton of money on marketing and they'll, 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 they'll spend money on warranties for their employees, but they tend on machinery and they'll spend money on marketing, but they tend to hire employees and just put them in that particular slot and forget about it. Yeah. Why wouldn't you invest in your employees if that's the most important thing for your business? So that's where there's a disconnect. Companies don't necessarily invest. Some do. I mean, we've got we've had clients over the years that do train. They bring in people to do training. They're they're concerned about the culture. They're concerned about becoming an employer of choice. But a lot of the smaller companies are just trying to get by, and um, you know, just like. I firmly believe that human resources is not an overhead, but it's a risk management tool. By having a good sound HR infrastructure in place, you can save yourself from getting fines. You can save yourself from lawsuits. But again, you have to do the right thing. You can't, it's not just, you know, put a body in a chair and keep things moving. So as you kind of look forward, as we kind of think about the end of our time together today, but giving people kind of some nuggets of information to think about. As you move forward, Mark, with your practice and my HR department, what are you going to be focused on in your strategic partnership with your clients serving in that HR advisory partnership role? Well, there's a couple of things that we look at right now. Right now, we're looking at uh, making sure that our clients are, are compliant, that they are up to date with the current you know, current and ever changing employment law landscape. They have the proper employee handbook. We want to we want to make sure that their HR infrastructure is solid. And then we want to, after we you know spend time on the tactical side of that, we want to make sure that their they, their strategy that they have an HR strategy. What are they going to do going forward? How are they going to improve the environment for their employees? How are they going to grow the business? And so it's really. First thing is to ensure that everything is in, is sound. The second part is there is, is the HR strategy. What are they going to do? What do we need to do to improve their employees? Do we need training? Do we need uh, uh, what kind of programs? You know how how are they going to grow the business? How are they going to onboard the business? Do they have the best technology in place strategically so that everything is running uh, like a fine tuned machine? Hey, hey, Mark, listen, but before we kind of wrap up today, I just want to say thank you for coming on the program. And if people want to reach you and have a little bit deeper conversation about you strategically advising them or asking you questions about a path forward for their HR, uh, how would they reach you? 
Well, there's a number of ways. They can reach us by phone at area code 914-243-9155, and I'm extension 101. They can reach me by email, mark with a C, M-A-R-C at myhrd.biz. And they can always check out our website at uh, www.myhrd.biz. And, and just to let everybody know, if you didn't capture that, you know, taking copious notes, I will put those links, Mark, in the description down below. So um, just again, thank you for coming on the program. If anybody wants to check out this and other videos on Chasing the Dream, be sure to subscribe and drop Mark and I a like for today's program. Hey, Mark, best of luck, and we'll be speaking soon. Thanks so much, Ethan. Look forward to chatting with you soon.